So all in all, Angus Crichton, best replacement aside from Dave Fafita. I really like Frizzell. I really like Talat Malolo. And I really like Cam Murray as probably the best replacements for Toe Harris in my opinion. Hey everyone, welcome back to another video from the Man Talks NRL Supercoach. Today, we are talking through the Round 19 trade targets and Round 19 preview. Plenty of curveballs have been thrown up with key players coming back from long injury layoffs, some key injuries that were sustained in Round 18, whether we need to trade out players or should we stick solid with who we've got at the moment, hold on to the very few trades that we've got left. So much stuff to get our teeth stuck into, so stick around for this one. And if you guys enjoy the video, as always, I greatly appreciate a thumbs up. Do please consider subscribing to the channel as well if you enjoy the content that I put out. And let's get straight into the round 19 trade targets and preview video. So let's get straight stuck into, I think, one of the biggest talking points of this week, and that is Toe Harris replacement. So Toe Harris has obviously been such a highly purchased player in the past few weeks for that round 17 coverage, but as we know, his season is over, unfortunately, and we need to fill the gap in that second row forward or in front row forward if you've got the dual players. I'll quickly touch on the front row forward replacements to go for. I feel like front row forward depth is not as much as the second row forward, so there's less options to, uh, to consider at front row forward. Isaiah Papali'i is hands down the best front row forward option to go for if you haven't got him already. 100% will be trying to make a switch of Harris to Isaiah Papali'i. I'm assuming that most people will have Isaiah Papali'i, so you're probably looking to fill in that second or third front row forward spot with like a Payne Haas and Adam Fanuel Blake, a Matt Lodge. I think they're all fantastic options. I've got Payne Haas and Adam Fanuel Blake, and I'm very happy with the pair of them. Fanuel Blake especially has been benefiting from extra minutes in the past few weeks. You know, one was Toe Harris's injury, um, or actually in the two games that Harris has been injured. Um, as a result, Fanuel Blake has played extra minutes. He's actually been given the captaincy this week as well. So, you know, Warriors draw, given the captaincy, he's obviously taking on a bigger role at that club. Potentially that means, I don't think that necessarily means extended minutes, but you know that he's one of their key guys. So that definitely does bode well. And I think Fanuel Blake is a great buy for a Toe Harris, as is Payne Haas, as now that it has been confirmed, Tevita Pangai is leaving the Broncos. Um, they're already pretty weak in the forwards. So you'd expect Payne Haas to be playing big minutes. And he's had two really nice games in the past couple of weeks. So I think those are the probably the best two front row forward replacements to go for outside of an Isaiah Papali'i. Now, if we turn our attention to the second row forward, Dave Fafita obviously is the number one candidate for second row forward targets for a Toe Harris replacement, in my opinion. The next three games for the Titans are really, really strong. They've got the Dragons this week. I believe it's the Bulldogs next week, and then it's the Cowboys the week after that. So a very, very nice three-game stretch. But for Fafita, his highest score of the season was against the Rabbitohs. He doesn't really need uh, you know, to have an easy opposition to get the super coach points. So I really like Fafita, obviously, as probably the number one trade in target for a Toe Harris replacement. I will also give two honourable mentions to Corey Harionaira, who put a massive score of 124 last week, and also to a Mitch Barnett. So CHN, I think he's still, I don't know if he's a buy. He had a very, very good last week, obviously scoring 124, but the draw for the Raiders is getting a bit tough as well. And I feel like in those tougher games, he might not have so much of that attacking potential. So I think there are probably, in my eyes, better options who've got similar, who are like around a similar price, maybe have similar upside, but have better matchups for the rest of the season. So for that reason, I haven't really gone, I'm not going to go too much in depth with a Corey Harionaira. Mitch Barnett has been named on an edge, which is going to be big news for him. The Knights draw is very good to end the season. And so Mitch Barnett, I don't know if I'd be going out and buying. I mean, I just sold him last week. And in retrospect, I wouldn't have made that trade if I had known that he was going to be playing on the edge again. I still have some concerns over his uh, position moving forward, whether you know him be being on the edge is going to be for the rest of the season or if it's just a one or two week thing, you know, maybe to teach Fitzgibbon a lesson, maybe. I don't actually know if he's been dropped out of the 17 for injury or if it's for, you know, bad form. But either way, I think there is still some question mark about, you know, Barnett's longevity on playing on the edge. So for that reason, I wouldn't be going out and buying him, but I think if you've got him, he's fine to hold. So now that we've got that all out of the way, I've put in eight second row forward options here, who I think are very, very good replacements for Toe Harris. Angus Crichton, Tyson Frizzell, Cam Murray, Hamoli Ulukuatu, Jason Tamalolo, Ryan Madison, Brandon Smith, and Luciano Leilua. So what I've tried to present here is a bit of a mix of players who have got, you know, they're all similarly priced around 500k. Some are a lot more expensive, like your Angus Crichton, your Brandon Smiths. Some are very highly owned. Again, Angus Crichton, Brandon Smith, very highly owned. Some are very much in that point of difference category, you know, like Tyson Frizzell, Ola Kuwatu, uh, even or like a Luciano Leilua. So I've tried to present a few different options. And one thing I have tried to also put some extra emphasis on, 
which of these guys have got a bit of a higher ceiling. So you can see there in that bottom line there, 90 plus games. That's the number of times so far this season that these guys have scored over 90 points because I feel like 90 points is pretty good for a second or a forward. Obviously 100 is amazing, uh, but generally I think around 90 for a second or a forward, that's usually, that usually happens, you know, when they've got a base of around 55 to 60 and then they get probably like one attacking stat, like a try and a, and a line break. That typically does push them into the 90 range, which is what you're looking for in your second row forward. So what stands out to me here is that Angus Crichton, Ryan Madison, Brandon Smith, and Cam Murray have all got scores of over 90 more than once so far this season. Surprisingly, Brandon Smith has actually done it three times this season. Obviously, part of that comes from that massive try scoring streak that he's um, had in like in the past couple of months. Cam Murray's two 90 plus scores have come very, very recently as well. And Ryan Madison obviously had a massive 135 last week that has definitely demonstrated that high upside that he's got. So I think it's really important to kind of you know factor that in, I think, when you're looking to replace him. Angus Crichton, in my opinion, is probably the safest uh, you know, replacement for Toe Harris. You know, I've said it quite a bit so far this season that I think your top three second row forwards is Day for Feeder, Angus Crichton, Toe Harris. So I think Angus Crichton is the second best uh, second row forward in the position. So I think Angus Crichton for me, if you haven't got him already, I would probably be trying to prioritize him as a replacement for Toe Harris. I do understand though that he is 629k. He's very expensive compared to Toe Harris is around 490k and a lot of these other guys are cheaper. So I thought it was a bit too easy to just say, oh yeah, go for Crichton. But the numbers speak for themselves. You know, it's an average, uh, sorry, a three round average of 72, uh, two games already over 90 this season. Um, he's definitely got that high upside and yeah, he's just been killing it. And the Roosters draw is not too bad for the rest of the season. Brandon Smith is also very highly owned, but the fact that he's the most expensive one here just kind of rules him out for me, I think, uh, because I feel like for me, Brandon Smith personally, I feel like it's too late to jump on him in my opinion. So I wouldn't be going out and getting Brandon Smith. I think the guys that you'd probably be looking at, it's like Frizzell, Cam Murray, Olukowatu, Lolo, and Luciana Lelua. I really, really like Tyson Frizzell, to be honest, as a buy for Toro Harris. Reason being is that, yes, his three-round average is pretty low at 50, but he's only just coming back from an injury. The Knights draw is fantastic, and Frizzell has definitely got that high upside. He's already had one game so far this season where he scored 113, and that was against the Sharks very earlier in the season, but he's got a lot of scores in like the 70s and 80s. He's got a very, very solid base of around 50 points a game. And I think he really is a strong point of difference. And so I'm looking to potentially get in Frizzell myself, maybe not this week, but next week potentially. I want to see one game out of him against the Roosters. He's got a pretty high break even of 99, but I really like Frizzell as a buy for Tohu. Cam Murray, I've mentioned it quite a bit in recent weeks, really like his attacking upside. He looks like he's come back into really strong form for NRL, and that's also translated for Supercoach. He's been able to get some attacking stats. He's fairly priced at 568k. The, the south draw is pretty good for the next couple of weeks, but in comparison to Vizel, to be honest, I think the Knights draw is so much better than Cam Murray's. The one issue I do have with Cam Murray as well is that if there's ever like any kind of injury in the back line, because he is so versatile, it's usually him who kind of you know slots into a different position. Like we saw last week, he did slot in that right center when Campbell Graham went off. Obviously, that did benefit Murray because he was able to score a try being in that position that he probably wouldn't have got if he was playing out lock. That definitely does give me some concern though because that does reduce his base stats and potentially gives him a bit of a lower floor if he ever does get shifted out but I think that's a very small reason potentially to you know avoid Cam Murray so I really strongly like Cam Murray but if I had to compare Murray and Frizzell to be honest I'd be going for Frizzell purely because I know the next you know the run home for the rest of the season is so much better for the Knights I see Frizzell more as a point of difference as well so I really like Frizzell for his appeal. Olukowatu also falls into this point of difference category. The one issue I have potentially with Olukowatu is that um, Curtis Sirinan is, a, I think, is due to come back sometime soon for Manly. And when he does, is Olukowatu going to drop out? I'm not so sure because Manly are a very strong team at the moment. You know, Jack Javojevic, Josh Schuster, Olukowatu, that's their like kind of starting back row and middle. With Curtis Sirinan and you know Jack Gazeski on the bench, on the bench, sorry, I just don't know how the rotation is going to go. Olukwatu, in my opinion, should be deserving of staying on that um, edge position because he's been playing so well for them in the past month. Manly's draw is also very good for the rest of the season, apart from two tough games they've got. Um, I mean, pretty tough. The Storm is in there as well as the Eels. That does maybe hinder his appeal a little bit, given that you know for four k more you can go for Frizzell, who basically after this week's draw is fantastic. You don't have to worry about him for matchups for the rest of the season. That's the one kind of um, downside I have with Olukowatu, and I feel like the time to get him was probably a few weeks back. Um, now that he's all gone all the way up to 520k, for me, when you're starting to say like Tamalolo's cheaper, Ryan Madison's not that much more expensive than him, it kind of does reduce the appeal for me for Olukowatu, but I think if you're looking for a really strong point of difference, Olukowatu could be the way to go. 
Jason Tamalolo at 512k. I mean, he's been doing pretty well in the past few weeks. He's got a three-round average now of 73. He just passed, He's passing the eye test a little bit more as well in NRL. He looks like he's offloading a little bit more. He's running strongly. His tackle breaking is there, up there as well. Um, and this week, obviously, is a very, very tough match against the Melbourne Storm. But after that, the Cowboys draw is pretty decent. They've got games against like the Broncos. I think they've got a game against the Titans in the next three after the Storm. So I really like Town Lolo's draw, and that definitely does lead him to getting more attacking stats. He's only had one game where he scored over 90 this this season. There was like one game where he scored like 101. Uh, but yeah, Town Lolo, I think, is still a very solid replacement for Toru Harris. Uh, but I definitely want to would I would definitely give it a week for Tambalolo purely because he's got that tough matchup against Storm and I wouldn't want to play him in that. Ryan Madison obviously coming off a massive 135. He's had two games now over in the season where he scored over 90. The one thing I will say with Madison though is that the Eels draw is very very tough to end the season. While I don't think that affects Madison so much because he's a back rower and they would get the majority of their points through you know kind of base statistics and tackling etc. I think that does cap his upside just a little bit, playing in those tough matchups. I feel like his minutes will be up playing in those tough games because the Eels will need him. He has had a, f- a few games in the past few weeks where his minutes have been down, but they have been in the easier games as well. So I'm, I'm not as concerned about the minutes for him moving forward. It's more about how much of that upside is he going to get when he's playing really tough games. And in, in the back end of the season, they've got Melbourne Storm, Panthers, they've got the Roosters, the Rabbitohs in the next kind of you know five to six games. So the, the draw for the Eels is pretty tough. But I definitely still like Madison overall as a buy. He's a proven super coach gun. You can't go too wrong with him. And the break even is very appealing as well. He's got a break even of two. And he's relatively low owned at 14%, you know, in comparison to like an Angus Crichton. So I think Madison is, in my opinion, probably a better buy than say like an Ola Kuatu. He's only a little bit more expensive. Um, and I think he's a much more proven super coach um, player than an Ola Kuatu. But I think the draw does put me off just a little bit. Brandon Smith, I've kind of given my thoughts on already. I think he, obviously, if money was no issue for you, I think he's a very fine, uh, you know, replacement for Toro Harris at second or forward. I'd probably prefer, though, to get Brandon Smith up to hooker if you could, just because the hooker position has got less options and he's probably the best option at the moment to go for. So I think if you can, I'd get him at hooker. And I think at second or forward, all these other guys that I've listed here are cheaper. And so I think for that reason, I wouldn't be considering for Brandon Smith as a second or forward replacement for Tohu. Luciano Lelua is the final guy I've got here. He's definitely also a point of difference. Um, and he's also one of the cheapest ones here at 474k. He's only owned by 6% of the game. So he definitely falls into that point of difference category. He's had one game this season where he scored over 90. So he hasn't really shown consistent like big upside. But the draw for the Tigers is very nice towards the back end of the season. Um, I'm less enthused by him because looking back at his historical scores for the rest of, so far this season, they're more around that 63 to 65, which is obviously not a bad score. But I think when you're looking to charge home for the end of the season, I think you're looking for guys who can get you 80s, 90s consistently. And for me, the guys who fit that bill out of this list here is Angus Crichton, Tyson Frizzell, and Tamalolo on his day. Those are the three that I'd probably go for. I mean, Cam Murray is also in that category. Um, probably, you know, him and Lolo, I think, is a tie. But Angus Crichton and Frizzell, I don't know why I'm so, like, thinking about Frizzell. I've got some random bias for the Knights draw. But, yeah, Frizzell, I really like him because I know that he's set for 80 minutes on an edge. He's, there's no question marks in, about Frizzell's role, in my opinion. And I think the Knights are very close to that, um, you know, getting into the top eight. They're going to want to feel their best team for the rest of the season. I think for him, it also depends if Mitchell Pierce does come back for the Knights next week. Because if he does, Mitchell Pierce plays on the right-hand side. That definitely means the ball's going to go a bit more towards that way, which is Tyson's Frizzell edge, where he's more likely to get some attacking stats. So all in all, Angus Crichton, best replacement, aside from Dave Fafita. I really like Frizzell. I really like Tal Malolo. And I really like Cam Murray as probably the best replacements for Toe Harris, in my opinion. One thing I'll also note, it just at least in my own position, I've got enough uh, depth at second and forward at the moment to not have to trade out Toe Harris. So one thing I'm looking to do is potentially also just wait a week. I want to see how Frizzell goes for another 80 minutes. I might want to see how Lolo goes against the Storm. If you know if he looks like he's killed it against the Storm, he might be the one that I go for. So that's one thing I'm doing as well. Maybe it's something I'd encourage. If you can cover Toe Harris for this week in terms of your second and forward depth, and you don't have to make the trade, I think it is probably worthwhile you know, giving each of these guys another game just to see how they go, because none of them have got really low break-evens. That's going to make their price change a lot. So I think that does give you some flexibility in terms of waiting a week to be able to make a better decision next week. Now, Alex Johnston is probably the next hot topic, whether we hold or we sell Alex Johnston. I guess the argument is that, well, he's been tipped to return in two to four weeks, which is a bit of a vague kind of range. If he does come back in that two-week period, he'd be missing 
the Warriors and the Dragons, which is annoyingly the two easy games that you'd want him for, and he'd be coming up against the Eels. One thing to note, though, is that he scored 154 against the Eels last time, so yes, it is a tough match on paper, but he still might do very, very well. If it's more than that, he could come back against the Titans in round 22. That would be three games. And then if it was uh, four games, it'd be the Penrith Panthers and then the Roosters in the rounds 23 to 24. So it really does depend. It's a hamstring, which does give me some concern because, I mean, look, I'm not a physio, you know, at all. So just take, I'm just kind of going off my gut feeling. But a hamstring injury is one of those finick, you know, kind of those finicky ones where, you know, if you feel something a little bit, you may be not wanting, wanting to rush it back. You know, Rabbitohs have got great coverage in their wingers as well, like Josh Mansour, Jackson Paulo, Tane Milne, you know, they can they can plug the gap, you know, at wing pretty well. And obviously Johnson is better than all of those three in their setup, at, you know, in my opinion. But there's no need for them to rush him. So that's my concern. And like, I think we've seen it a little bit this season as well. When guys have got injuries and, you know, it's like two to four weeks, I feel like people have been punished more for holding as opposed to selling. Just because you know the way that there are big, you know, big scores on offer. If you if you tend to hold a player um, and you don't make use of that trade or that value, and you say you don't get a good replacement who can match the upside of them, then it really does become hard to you know make up the points later because you're keeping someone on the bench. So for that argument, I would sell just because of the unknown in terms of when he's going to return. Like if we knew he was coming back in round uh, in you know, in two weeks against the Eels, I'd probably just hold him because it's a short term thing and he's one of the best center wings going around at the moment. Any longer than that, though, uh, it does become a bit concerned, especially because if he does come back and say that game against the Panthers, I'd, I don't know if I'd want to be playing him in that one because his base statistics are so low. It is also very much dependent on you know how many trades you've got left um, and the depth that you've got in center wing. So I've just got a quick sample of my current center wing setup and what I'm thinking about maybe doing. So at the moment, I've got Ruben Garrick, Nico Hines, Brian To'o, Matt Ikevalu as my starting four center wings, and I've got David Offaluma as well on the bench. So I've got plenty of center wing depth to cover Alex Johnson. So technically, I don't actually have to trade him out this week, just because I know I can cover him pretty well. Obviously, there are concerns potentially about Nico Hines moving forward, um, you know, given that, you know, with Pappenhausen back, we don't know what his role is going to be moving forward. So it's kind of a weird argument where, yes, I know I can cover him, but I also know that if I trade him out, that unlocks a lot of money, you know, 770k, you can do anything you want with that. You can go down to like a 500k decent centering option um, and you can you know, bank like 250k to help with upgrades down the line. But the other side of me says, I've got five trades left. I think it's very, very wise if I can hold trades for as long as I can. And if I don't have to trade him out because I've got the centering depth, I probably shouldn't have to unless there's a centering option who I don't have that I feel like is going to completely outscore him. And for me, I don't think there is one at the moment who exists out there. You know, if I didn't own like a Ruben Garrick, that would be a different story because then I would probably go out and buy a Ruben Garrick instead of a, you know, if, if I had an Alex Johnson sitting there and I didn't have Garrick. But apart from that, oh, you know, similar argument as well, sorry, exists for like a Brian Toto as well. But I feel like I've got those key guys and I've got a couple of decent, point, uh, you know, point of different center wings who can give high upside like Ikevalu and potentially Nofaluma as well. So I think there is good value in selling him because you unlock a lot of cash and you can use those funds. But from the trades point of view, I think I'm probably going to hold. And I think that's the way I would go about it. If you've got less than like five trades, I would probably hold. If you've got more than that and can afford to do a few more flips, I would probably sell and make use of that value. Now, in terms of the players who we can actually bring in, if you do decide if you do decide to sell AJ, as I kind of mentioned, Ruben Garrick, Brian Toto, you know, those gun, absolute gun center wings for the rest of the season. If you don't have them already, they would be the absolute targets in my opinion. If you've got them already and you're just looking to maybe add some extra depth to your center wing, say for example, Alex Johnson is your fourth center wing and you need to trade him out, I've put four replacements here who I think can do a pretty decent job for the rest of the season. You know, Dan Gagai, his Rabbitohs teammate, at 630k, he's got a pretty decent average of 67, and he's got two games where he scored over 90 this uh, so far this season, and he, that was a, one of them was a really, really big score of like 130 plus. He has he has had really, really massive games, and I really like the next two weeks for the Rabbitohs. You know, the Warriors and the Dragons. Warriors have been ravaged with so many injuries. The Dragons are still kind of working through, you know, changing their team up with all their different suspensions, and the Rabbitohs are just clicking on all cylinders at the moment and especially playing on the left-hand side, I really like Gagai as a buy. And so I think even going down from an Alex Johnson to Gagai, that's saving you like 140K. So that's a lot of money that you can use. You know, you could go from like a Toe Harris and get close to like an Angus Crichton. That'd be a good set of two trades in my opinion. Um, obviously it's burning two trades, but if you're set on selling Alex Johnson, I really like Gagai as a buy. Josh Adokar, I've got next. There's probably a bit of a theme that's going to be here with these four center wings. I've tried to go for the more point of difference uh, guys, although Adokar is 15% owned. 
I've tried to go for the point of difference because I feel like at this point in the season, um, it's really, really good if you've got those really you know safe guys like Toto or Garrick. Just take a punt on a few point of difference players who can really give you high upside and can really push you um, far in the rankings if you're focused on overall. So Josh Adokal at 518k. The Storm draw is pretty up and down for the next few weeks. I mean, they've got a great matchup against the Cowboys this week. They have got some tougher games coming up where you probably would sit um, Adokal. So I think this is one of those you know scenarios where if you're looking to just build depth um, when you're trading out Alex Johnson, you can go easily go to like an Adokal at 518k and just play him on the matchups because we've seen... Um, he's had three games over 90 this season and he's averaging pretty solidly. You know, he's got an average of 63 throughout the season, which is surprisingly given, you know, it's surprising given how low his base is. And so he can give you those really low scores like of 20s. But with the Storm being that good of a team, we've seen Adokar get 178, 100 because he just has to finish like three or four tries and boom, he's on his way to a big score. So Adokar really, I like him as one of those guys that you can plug in for you know the good matchups. Next, I've got Corey Thompson. As I mentioned with the Titans, the next three games are really, really nice. And I like Corey Thompson because he was killing it at the beginning of the season. With Marzu coming back into the team, I'd expect Marzu to be playing on the right-hand side and Corey Thompson on the left. Him playing on the left is where he was getting all of his super coach points to begin the season. He was averaging around 70, lots of tackle busts, finishing quite a few tries. And at 475k, I think he is a great point of difference, only 2% owned. And he's had two games so far this season where he scored over 90. So similar upside to like a dang guy guy. So I really like Corey Thompson as a replacement as well for Alex Johnston. Matt Ikevalu is the final guy that I've gone for. I own Ikevalu and he's been really helped out by some junk tries as he scored last week against the Cowboys. He's had three games where he scored over 90, which is actually, you know, that strike rate is actually better than any of these guys because he missed quite a few games at the beginning of the season um, and he still has scored just as many like high, big upside games as like a Josh Adokar. And he's very similarly priced to Adokar. He's got a minus 12 break even. So this is one of those cases where it's a bit more better. It's better to get him in the sooner rather than later before his price gets too high. Um, and there's no job security issues over him, something that I flagged a couple of weeks ago because because Joseph Suwali is out for the rest of the season. So Matt Ekavalu has locked down that right-hand wing spot. And so I think, again, he's similar to Adokar, play him on the matchups, and he can give, easily give you those high upside games of like 100 plus, as he did last week. He just has to score a couple of tries and 123 easy as. So I really like um, Ikevalu potentially as a point of difference buy as well. So as I did last week, we'll quickly go through the top 10 trade ins and trade outs. So on the left hand side of with the trade outs and not too many surprises here to be honest. I mean Toe Harris and Alex Johnson as the number one and two surprise to me at all. Carl Lawton as well is out because he's picked up a significant injury. So that also is no surprise that people are cashing in on Carl Lawton. Jaden Braley at number four was pretty interesting. I mean again, he hasn't been doing that he hasn't been doing that well in the past few weeks, but I, I really like the Knights draw for the rest of the season. I just don't know how much value there is doing a trade at hooker when you know Jaden Braley to say like a Reed Marnie who's like the most traded in player as I mentioned the Eels draw is pretty tough for the rest of the season so I feel like doing Jaden Braley to Reed Marnie is kind of the opposite because you're trading the guy who's got the very good draw coming up to the guy who's got a tough draw coming up I know Reed Marnie has been delivering super crunch points much better than a Braley uh, but he you know Reed Marnie is not going to be playing the Titans every week where he scored 98 um, and I think that attacking upside that Miney can provide is going to be capped a little bit in those tougher games. So for that reason, I don't actually know if I'd be trading Braley to Miney. To be honest, if I was trading Braley to anyone, it'd be Harry Grant. And that's only if I see him coming back and playing well. For me, I'm probably just going to hold Braley um, for the rest of the season by the looks of it. Because I've only got five trades left. And I kind of want to save those for like the big hitter moves, I'd say like fullback. Um, and then to cover potential injuries and suspensions that may come up for the rest of the season. Joseph Swali, Bailey Simonson, Mitchell Moses, Val Holmes, uh, you know, are the next kind of lot of players traded out. No surprises there because Swali's out for the rest of the season. Simonson's out for like the still the next three to four weeks. Mitchell Moses, similar, about three to five weeks that he's going to be out. Um, and Val Holmes is not coming back until about round 22, I think. So that, that makes complete sense as to why they're all being traded out. Jason Saab as the ninth most traded out is quite interesting. One person did also ask me um, if it's worth trading out Jason Saab. For me, if you've held Saab up until this point, you know, Turbo's back, Manly's draw is not too bad for the rest of the season, I would keep Saab as good depth in your center wing and play him on the matchups, to be honest, because we know that when Turbo plays uh, in the Manly side, Saab's average is like around 70. It's a completely different player when Turbo's in the team. And so I think for me, Saab, I would actually hold because unless Saab was like your ticket to like a Ruben Garrick or Brian Toto, I don't know if I'd be trading him out for anyone to be honest because I think Manly's draw is just as good as a lot of the other teams and their attack is you know very very fluid especially when you've got Tom Trevojevic there so for me Saab is actually a hold. Sean Johnson as the 10th most traded out look it makes sense to me because he 
was pretty horrible to be honest um last week in Supercoach scoring at least the 17 points um and ever since it seems like ever since he signed that contract with the Warriors his performances have slipped a little bit I just don't know if I'd be doing, doing the trade this week though he's coming up against the Bulldogs this week surely if there's one you know one or two games in the calendar that you'd want your guy playing it's against the Bulldogs or if it's against the Broncos so for me Johnson I'll give him one more week hopefully he goal kicks but I'm not expecting him to goal kick this week Hopefully you can do a job against the Bulldogs and then after that I'll see if I want to trade him out. Now in terms of the top 10 trade-ins, Reed Miney, I've kind of mentioned him already. I think obviously he's probably one of the best hookers to go for but I, that draw is pretty um, pretty tough for the Eels for the rest of the season so I don't know how much value you're going to get out of Reed Miney um, bringing him in at this stage. Payne Haas, as I touched on with Toe Harris, I think he's a phenomenal front or forward trading target, um, so no surprise that he's the second. Ryan Madison as well, I think a lot of people have looking at that 135 from last week, but as I've kind of touched on, I think Madison is obviously going to be very good and probably give you a 65 to 70 average for the rest of the season, but I think there are a few guys who are a little bit cheaper than him, like Frizzell, um, or you know, around his price, like a Cam Murray, who probably could do very similar or even a better job for the rest of the season. So I I mean, yeah, I understand why we, uh, why sorry, why Ryan Madison is such a highly purchased player, but I would maybe reconsider that, if, unless obviously if you've already got a lot of those other second row forwards in there. But like me personally, I'm waiting a week on Madison, um, and also a lot of these other second row forwards, so I can make a bit of a better decision on that next week. Tom Trevojevic, as um, he should always be number one in my opinion. Just get him into the team if you don't have him already. Um, I can't say much more about that. Adam Dewey as the fifth again. I think he's got a minus like 40 break even and he put up 154 against the Broncos so I think Adam Dewey at 566k this is the week I think to be getting him in. One conundrum I myself am having is that I've got Cody Walker and I've got Josh Schuster as my 5'8s so you know Cody Walker I'm not trading out anytime soon. Adam Dewey for uh, you know for Schuster it does feel sideways to in a sense because Schuster came back last week with an amazing performance uh, you know scoring 96 but 96 is not 154 you know so and I really like Dewey. This week is pretty tough against Manly, though. That's the only reason why I'm not potentially doing the trade. For me, Schuster, I'm looking to hold him potentially until round 21. That's when Manly have a really tough two-game stretch. At that point, I'm hoping maybe we've got better news about you know Nathan Cleary. Maybe I can get into Cherry Evans. So I'm not looking to rush in Dewey because I feel like there might potentially be other guys who I might prefer. But Dewey's draw is amazing for the rest of the season, so I really like him as a buy. Brian Toto, no surprises there, he's the best, one of the best center wings to go for, so definitely get him in. Nico Hines, seventh most purchased player, that does surprise me a little bit, given that, you know, with Pappenhausen back, we may see Hines go back to the bench sometime soon, but for me, yeah, I wouldn't be buying him. Yes, he scored 166 last week, but for me, I wouldn't be buying him at this point in time, given that he's, you know, he's almost coming to the end of his run. Day for feeder, no surprises there. Jerome Hughes, I think, is still a very, very good option. Just keep an eye out for some news because he did go off um, with 25 minutes to go in that last week's game due to a um, calf complaint. Um, I think it's all good. I think it was more precautionary than anything else. Just keep an eye on that before you say to trade him in this week. But yes, definitely Hughes, I think, is a fantastic halfback trade-in. 96 last week. Storm just seemed to be piling on the points. The only kind of caveat I'd have with Hughes and basically any of the other Storm gun players is that they are prone to resting. We see Cam Munster has been rested this week. We may see that down the line as well. So I think the only thing I would say is that if you are looking to bring in these guys like Hughes, just make sure you've got enough coverage at halfback to cover him. Uh, otherwise, go for it. Very, very good trade-in. And Angus Crichton, as I mentioned, probably one of the better trade-in targets as well for Toro Harris. So we'll just get on to our vice-captain and captaincy candidates for the week. I think there's quite a few different you know, vice-captain options, but for me, the captaincy does stand out pretty clearly. I won't beat around the bush. Tom Tavoyevic coming up against the Tigers, who are the sixth worth at defending fullbacks. He's had plenty of rests since Origin Game 3. Uh, he scored like seven tons out of his nine games so far this season, averaging 129. Captain with confidence. That's all I'll say about him. Now, in terms of potentially some other options, for VC, I think Clint Gutherson, this is the problem. You can't really vice captain Clint Gutherson or James Tedesco if you decide to go for a captaincy on Tom Tavoyevic, given that they play in the same position. It's as simple as that. If you just don't decide to captain Tom Trevojevic, then you can go for a vice captain on Gutherson or Tedesco. Gutherson should be goal kicking against the Raiders, and he's coming off 110, and he's proving to be one of the, well, he is the top scoring uh, fullback actually so far this season. Um, so yeah, one of the better buys that I've made so far this uh, this season, although I bought him at the wrong time. I should have bought him before Origin, and not when I was supposed to be buying Tom Trevojevic. James Tedesco as well, you know, coming off some, you know, rest after Game 3 set of Origin. The Knights conceded 166 to Nico Hines last week. So, you know, maybe the the other fullback can do similar damage. Obviously, Tedesco isn't goal-kicking, um, although actually, given the way that 
Africa goal kicks. We might see Tedesco goal kick, but I really like Tedesco as a vice captain as well if you're unwilling to go the captaincy on Tom Trevojevic. Nico Hines and Jerome Hughes, I think, are great vice captaincy or potential point of difference captain options. You know, the Cowboys have been riddled with injuries. Um, they are the sixth worst at defending fullbacks and the worst at defending halfbacks. So that bodes good news for both Jerome Hughes and Nico Hines. Nico Hines is probably likely going to be my vice captain, depending on what news we get out of the Storm camp in the hour before kickoff. If it looks like Pappenhausen is still coming off the bench, or if there's any indication that no, you know, Nico Hines might not play the full 80, that does definitely mean I wouldn't captain him for sure. The vice captaincy is probably still okay to keep on him, and if it looks like Hines goes into 5'8 and Pappenhausen goes at starting fullback, I'd probably be happy to vice captain Nico Hines. Um, but hopefully, as well, we might get some better information as well about who goal kicks because that hasn't been confirmed yet. Cody Walker against the Warriors was also relatively safe for vice captain or captaincy play. You know, they're the 11th worst at defending 5 8, so they've been pretty good at that position. Uh, but Cody Walker has always proven to have a very high upside. He didn't show that last week against the Bulldogs, scoring 79, but just the week prior to that, he scored 130. So I think Cody Walker could be a very solid vice captain option. If you're looking to go really point of difference towards the back end of the week, Brian Toto against the Broncos could be a potential flyer for a captaincy option. The Broncos are the second worst at defending center wings. And the thing with Toto is that he's so solid is that he doesn't have to give you a try or any attacking stats and he'll still give you 60 to 65 just in his work rate alone. Just add a try or two and he'll give you 100 plus. Which is the reason why I think if you say maybe you want to go for like a vice captaincy on Tom Javovic, then you can maybe go for a captaincy on Brian Toto on the Sunday. Similar approach with De Fafida coming up against the Dragons. Dragons have been the second worst at defending edge back rollers. Fafida only scored 68 last week and he generally looked a bit uninvolved at times, which does give me some concern about captaining him. So for that reason, I'm probably leaning to go away from Fafida captain and stick strong on a Tom Trevojevic. So we'll go through some player break evens, but because I've already spent quite a bit of time talking through a lot of the key players, um, I'll try not to spend too much time in this. I say this every week, although I still feel like I talk about it for 10 minutes or so. For the Broncos, the only other player I'll kind of touch on is Katoni Staggs. He's got a high break even of 82 at 518k. I mean, as I mentioned, if you want to wait a week on trading out Alex Johnson, I think you could very easily trade uh, Katoni Staggs in instead if he puts in another good performance because he is coming up against a tough opposition in the Panthers. So I think Tony Staggs could be a decent point of difference center wing option for the rest of the season. The Broncos draw isn't actually that bad. Uh, and he's coming off like a 64 and a 50. So two very solid scores. So for that reason, I'm also leaning to maybe um, holding AJ. Just in case I'm, I might want to go to a Staggs next week. But see, I haven't just quite made up my mind yet. Out of the Bulldogs, to be honest, I'm not really interested in that many of their players. In my uh, best draw video, I did briefly touch on Jake Avarillo as a real, real point of difference, given that he's goal kicking. And the Bulldogs actually, in my opinion, have the third best draw for the rest of the season. But I say that more as I'm throwing out the option for you guys. I just don't know if I'll do it myself. For the Raiders, similarly, I think they've got the second toughest draw for the rest of the season. So I don't think I'd be looking at too many of their guys. I mean, Corey Harionara has got a break even of... Uh, 38 and at 545k he could be a decent second row forward replacement but as i've mentioned earlier i think there potentially are better options with higher upside with that better draw for the rest of the season out of the dragons no interest for me to be honest i mean ben hunt probably the best option maybe if you're looking to fill in that hooker but even the dragons draw is also getting pretty tough as we go further and further towards the end of the season so for that reason i'm not looking too closely at any of their players for the Sea Eagles, I feel like I've spoken about most of the guys that I want to in terms of like um, Ola Kowatu, Cherry Evans, Tom Trevojevic. So I don't think there's actually many players that have got like a very, very low break even that I would think as a central trade in targets. One thing I will mention is that Josh Schuster has got a break even of 21. So hopefully he does go up a little bit in price over the next few weeks. As I mentioned in round 21, when they do come up against the Storm, that might be a good time to cash in on him. If you are looking to, you know, flip to another 5'8 or even a halfback for the rest of the season. From the Melbourne Storm, I mean, Ryan Pappenhausen is the man that we're all looking at. A uh, break even of a 205 at 815k. This is the reason as well why I'm looking to maybe hold off a week on him just to see how he goes. See if he even gets goal kicking back because that definitely was a big reason for his appeal towards the beginning of the season. So yeah, I definitely want to see how he goes because he's got such a high break even that he could drop in cash to like 700k just for next week um, and could be prime for picking up if I'm really, really impressed by what I see out of him. I did get a couple of questions about Remus Smith as well. He's got a break even of 67 at 400k. 
potentially. I think a lot of people may be thinking that with Pappenhausen coming back into the team and George Jennings' injury, that maybe Remus Smith goes out to the right wing and then Nico Hines goes in at centre. Look, if that happens, I think that definitely improves Rem, uh, Remus Smith's appeal because I feel like wingers are just more likely to finish those tries and get those higher upsides games than playing at centre. But given that that's not, we just don't know yet that that's how that's going to be happening, I'd much rather just go for a Josh Adokar who's just locked in for the left wing if you are looking to go for one of the Storm wingers. From the Knights, as I mentioned, I'm very, very high on the Knights draw for the rest of the season. And if they get Mitchell Pierce back next week, that's a big, big plus as he definitely makes a big improvement to that team. Um, in my best draw video, I actually mentioned Dominic Young as a decent trade-in. Given that he's got a minus nine break, even at 306k, look, if you're looking to go for a, kind of a cheap center wing just as a bit of a flyer, then, you know, Dominic Young, you might not be doing any worse than that. Uh, Connor Watson with the break even of 24 the gift that keeps on giving he just seems to stick around in our teams and now that he's starting out lock based on uh, teamless Tuesday very happy to hold him for the rest of the season and I think very much as a play in your 17s now week on week especially in those easier games coming up he definitely possesses that attacking threat Kalen Ponga, who I haven't spoken about so far this video, I think he's one of the best trading targets out of the Knights with 140 break even at 650k. He should hopefully tank a bit more in price this week, um, coming up against the Roosters. Um, and then, you know, when the draw for the Knights completely opens up, I think he looks like a fantastic trading target option for round 20. From the Cowboys, outside of Tamalola, who I've spoken a little bit about, I'm not really interested too much in any of their players. I won't go into too many details about the players from the Eels, given that their tough draw is coming up. I feel like I've said that for five or six times so far this video, but yeah, tough draw coming up. I'm, I'm not really looking too much in their back line, and I think in terms of the key forwards like Ryan Madison, Reed Miney, I've kind of given my thoughts about them already. From the Panthers, it's a bit of a weird one. The Panthers have just kind of gone a little bit under the radar in terms of super coach options, basically ever since Nathan Cleary has gone out. I'm just looking at his price there of $1.1 million and a break even of 208. I'm, I don't know. I might potentially do an Alex Johnson down to like a Greg Mazu, free up 700k. Maybe if I want to go to like Josh Schuster to Nathan Cleary down the line. But I don't. I think that's one of those. I think it's one of those cases where um, we just need to get the concrete news as when he's coming back. And then even that, do, do we want to see it for another week? Probably just to see how he goes um, coming back from that shoulder injury. And I think early reports were that he was coming back in round 20 against the Storm. So. Uh, well, actually, that would be next week. So I think maybe around 21, he could be a, a decent or uh, well, a slightly better price to trade in. I will mention his Haas partner in Jerome Luai. I mean, at that price at 359k, he's got a break in of 65, but the, at 359k, Jerome Luai, he could be one of the best budget buys um, of the week. Given that he's got this game against the Broncos, you'd expect him to be taking a much more dominant role in the halves and playmaking, um, and he could be in for a monster game. A lot of people who I think still own Jerome, uh, Jerome Luai, I would definitely still be holding because of that great matchup this week. And if you're looking to go real point of difference, you know, go budget in your 5-8, I would look no further than a Jerome Luai. From the Sharks, I've kind of, you know, been a bit less interested in their players, just given I think their attack at the moment with uh, Sean Johnson and Braden Trindle in the halves is not gelling the same as it was as what it was with Matt Moylan and Sean Johnson. So for that reason, I'm not looking too hard at their players. The draw is still very decent, so I think you can take a punt easily on like a Jesse Raymond, who's got very solid base, uh, or, on, or on the wingers like a Sione Katoa or a Ronaldo Mulatalo, who I probably prefer a little bit over a Katoa. From the Rabbitohs, I mean, the enticing one there is Tane Milne with a minus 15 break even, but he's been benched. So we can't go there with Tane Milne. Dango guy, who I've spoken a little bit about, he's got a very high break even of 136, but I feel like, you you know, if you're going down from an Alex Johnston, then, you know, obviously you'll be able to afford that in terms of the money. And so I think he's looking like a good trade-in option as well at center wing. From the Roosters, not too many other players I'm looking to discuss. I mean, Matt Cavalli with a minus 12 break even, I've kind of given my thoughts on him. I think he'll be a pretty decent trade-in option. Sam Walker with a minus four break even. I think, again, one of these guys that you can keep for the rest of the season and play on the good matchups. For example, this week against the Knights, this is the team I think that he scored 163 against so far, um, you know, earlier this season. So Sam Walker, still really like him. Don't think I am necessarily would say he's a buy. I feel like there are better halfback options, but definitely someone, one of those guys that you can continue to hold. Joey Manu with a break even of 13. Look, now that he's been pushed back to center wing, I think if you did jump on him a couple of weeks ago, uh, if he was not like one of your starting four center wings, I would probably look to be moving him on to a different player just because when he plays in the center wing, he's just not as good of an option at super coach compared to a, uh, when he plays at fullback. But if he's one of those kind of depth guys like your fifth or sixth, I think he be, could be okay to keep for the rest of the season just uh, sitting there on the bench just in case towards the back end of the season if Tedesco gets a rest, you would expect that Manu goes into fullback again. 
and Victor Radley at 373k with a low break even of 8. He could also be he could be like a Brandon Smith light 2.0 in the fact that he's a dual second row forward hooker. Um, he's like 300k cheaper than Brandon Smith, um, and in the past couple of weeks he's looked really he's passed the eye test for me. You know, kind of resuming that ball playing role for the Roosters. I um, mean, he's had pretty be- um, sorry he's had pretty decent base statistics numbers over the past couple of weeks as well. So I actually don't even mind him. You know, if you wanted to get him in as like a fourth or fifth second row forward or as a reserve hooker. From the Titans, I think I've kind of already spoken about the key trade-in options there. You've got Greg Mazu with a minus 12 break-even, so definitely a good week to jump on him as you'll go up a little bit in price after this week. You've got Corey Thompson with a pretty high break-even of 98, but I think because the next three weeks are the good weeks for the Titans, you'd probably want to look into bring, be bringing him in this week irrespective of that break-even. And David Feeder, don't worry about the break-even, just get him in. From the Warriors, I mean, their draw for the rest of the season is also very, very good. You know, Cody Nikarima does stand out there with a very, very high break, even of 133. But uh, if you have got him, like me, uh, I would be looking to hold him because that draw is so good for the rest of the season. I feel like you're gonna, you're not really going to gain much in terms of the value by selling him. So I definitely would be holding Nikarima for the time being. I think in addition to Adam Fennell Blake, who's got a break even of 47, I really like Matt Lodge as well in your front row forward. He's got a very decent break even as well of 37. Um, out of those two, though, I'd probably would prefer Adam Fennell Blake just simply because he is cheaper and he has been given that captaincy. And I feel like historically we see Adam Fennell Blake showing that upside more than a Matt Lodge. And so I think in the next few weeks, I would expect uh, Fennell Blake to actually outscore Matt Lodge. And finally, on the Tigers, you know, Adam Dewey, minus 37 break-even is a great trade-in option as well. And I think if you if you can easily get to him, definitely would be advocating for that move. And I also still really like David Nofaluma potentially as a fifth or sixth centering option for some depth. Uh, or Luciana Letlua as a point of difference second row forward. So a quick shout out to Daniel who topped round 18 in our overall group league with a massive 1,546 and he's pretty decently placed in the overall rankings at 2,281, not too dissimilar to me. So hopefully me and Daniel can make a push for the top 1,000 for the rest of the season. And in terms of our overall group league top 5, we still got Andrew from Eliminators in the top 10 who's ranked at 8th, so hopefully he can kick on and um, you know do well for the rest of the season. Um, and behind him we've got Marcelo, Jason, James and James again, who are all placed in the top 260. So they're all doing really, really well, you know, still very much in a position to go for the top 100. And if anyone wants to join the group code, it's 286239. Well that's it guys, that is the round 19 trade targets and preview. I imagine this video is going to be a little bit longer than some of the other ones, so um, completely understand if you want to skip ahead to the different sections I'll, as always I will put the chapters in the video just to make it a little bit easier to navigate but it just felt like there was a lot of stuff that we had to discuss this week so hopefully you guys don't mind that it's a little bit longer this week if you enjoyed it would really appreciate a thumbs up do please consider subscribing to the channel as well if you haven't already um, in terms of my trades I just don't quite know yet at the moment so if you guys want to you can follow me on Twitter where I'm more likely to post my different trade options otherwise I'll put it in the comments below as well if I do finally decide but until then See you guys in the next video.